Hello, students! Are you ready to be thrown into a pool of the unknown? You will be critiqued and criticized in front of your peers. You will work long days and long nights endlessly many times without knowing what you are looking for. You will have to do the same things over and over and over again. Your project will haunt you from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep. If you're going to sleep, that is. If you're ready for this, then sit tight, because in this video, I'm going to give you 10 life tips that I wish I had when I was in architecture school. Just over 10 years ago, when I was just 18 years old, I decided to make the biggest investment of my life and applied for architecture school. I spent about $70,000 and six years of my life drawing, sketching, getting criticized for my work, and falling asleep in the computer lab. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. With any other type of investment, you would want some kind of certainty in the success of the outcome, but when it comes to our education, we kind of go into it with blind faith. Don't get me wrong, I am very happy that I made that decision 10 years ago, and I can't imagine myself doing anything else, but recently, I have been thinking about how I could have maximized the returns on my investment <laughs> and how different life would be if I knew 10 years ago some of the things that I know now. So in this video, I want to talk about 10 things I wish I knew or thought about before starting architecture school. Focus on building meta skills as well as your hard skills. So I remember this one time I was working on a project with a classmate and I was just really frustrated because I felt like he was not really contributing on the design and I just felt like he wasn't really pulling his weight. I'm sure you are also gonna come across a situation like this because there are a lot of group projects and everyone kind of has different standards and everyone has different ways of working, you know, and some people are just not that great to work with. But when you leave school and work in an office, this is something that principals or project architects have to do every day. You know, they need to teach young interns. They need to explain things to clients and consultants. And every day we're solving problems that are not just design related, but people related. So these kind of unfortunate but inevitable group situations are kind of the perfect opportunity for you to practice how to communicate and also how to inspire people and how to explain things and I think these are all skills that are gonna become very helpful down the road. Develop a skill that you can monetize. When I finished architecture school I had around $50,000 in student loans and my starting intern salary was $50,000. So my mindset was to do everything and anything possible to pay this back as fast as possible. So I started looking at like looking for side work, like I knew how to draft, I knew how to do renders, I knew how to take photographs. So I told all my coworkers and everyone I knew that if they ever needed any of these things, I could do it for a really, really good price. And so I started getting some work here and there. But what I didn't realize is that the work would take way more time than I had anticipated because I wasn't actually that good at any of them compared to a professional. I also didn't know how to charge properly to compensate for my time. So it actually took me um, a couple tries to get to a level where I could actually like offer my services professionally for a decent fee. 
If you are someone who wants to offer some side services, check out places like Upwork and Fiverr and see what level of competence is out there and how much you can charge for them. Something else that I learned is that you should try to get into the habit of setting your own price and asking what you think you're worth. Obviously do the research, but one of the things that I realized makes a really big difference in your fee, surprisingly, is not necessarily the, um, the quality of the work, but it's actually the quality of the service. So if you are able to communicate with your clients really well, give them timely responses and feedback, you'll get great reviews and you can charge a lot more. This is especially prevalent now where you have people charging like literally $5 for a rendering. So I think the communication and the service actually makes a really big difference. And I was actually pretty surprised about this too. There's just so many ways for you to make money these days that's not tied to your job. And architecture school is a really great place for you to explore some of those skills, but it's your job to make it specific and unique enough for it to be marketable. Grades don't really matter. This might kind of come as a surprise, but unless you're applying for scholarships or awards, Grades don't really matter in architecture school as long as you pass everything. I used to get so mad about getting a B because i um, Asian, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I realized after graduating that people just really look at your portfolio and nobody really cares that you got to see in structures. And maybe this is kind of a contentious argument because of course, like you want to do your best work, but if I knew this in architecture school, I feel like I would have done a couple of things differently. For example, if it came down to sitting down and like really understanding something versus finishing an assignment on time, but like really fast for a deadline. So you gather your friends and you pull your resources. I would have chosen to sit down and like really understand the problem and the solution, even if it meant getting a lower grade in the assignment. You always think that you're gonna come back to it and go over it later, but you rarely do. So if I actually knew that starting out, I think my strategy for school would have been a little bit different. Iterate and document the process. Design is an iterative process, so don't be one of those people who falls in love with their first idea. Really good designers are able to iterate through different options and change their design drastically really quickly. Your design is going to change as you try different options and you might circle around and come back to your initial idea. But because of this, it's so, 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 so important for you to document the process. Sometimes it's not about the idea, but the process and how you got to that final point. And I've also mentioned this in my how to create an architecture portfolio video that in fact, the thought process is what firms are more interested in seeing, not really beautiful renderings because beautiful renderings are so common these days. Understand the law of diminishing returns. Just because design is an iterative process, it doesn't mean that you should work on your project without any time constraints. And I think the law of diminishing returns is just as applicable in design. And if you don't know what it is, it's an economic theory that tells us that after a certain point, you will have reached an optimal level of capacity and adding any additional inputs will actually reduce the returns on the inputs. So this over here is you right in the morning or right after a coffee break, you're pumping out your drawings and iterations and uh, 
um, here maybe you go and have dinner and it's starting to get late and it's 3 a.m. and you can't remember what you've been working on for the past hour, your computer's starting to crash, and you're forgetting where you saved your file. <laughs> I've been there and I remember it like yesterday. <laughs> Try to understand your peak times and when you're the most effective. I think everyone kind of has a time when they're the most effective and everyone also has a time when they're the most creative. When I was doing my masters, I realized that I was a better writer in the mornings and that I could come up with more interesting design solutions in the evenings. So once I actually started implementing this into my days and started building a routine around it, I was just so much more effective and I was getting so much more done and I was getting so much more quality work done. Learn from your crits. I remember this one time I had a pretty, pretty bad crit and I was fairly upset about it. Not just cause I'd worked on this thing for days and nights on end, not just cause my worth was so intimately attached to this project. Not just because the juries poked some really fair holes into my project, but because I was not really able to answer a lot of the questions that, that they threw at me. I was so upset that when the crit was over, all I wanted to do was just go home, shower, <laughs> and go to sleep. I just really wanted to erase the memory of that entire crit from my mind. When I woke up, I made it a point to go through the notes that my friend had taken for me and look at the project objectively. And this is actually the project that eventually led to my thesis project, which I won the AIA Henry Adams Award for. I think crits are possibly the most critical learning moments of your project because you have your group of juries, most of whom have never seen your project before, and they're reacting purely to your presentation of it. And it's a fairly accurate assessment of your design and your ability to communicate your ideas. And you will have bad crits, that's for sure. And you'll also have good crits. What's really important is that you think of them as an opportunity to get critical feedback on your work and on your thought process, and you, you learn from that. And you will continue to have crits after school and into your career. So it's really important for you to have a growth mindset about this. Actively ask questions and engage your profs. So school is an environment and probably the few phases of your life where you're going to be surrounded with people who have much, much, much more knowledge than you. And at the same time, their whole job is to teach you stuff. Don't be afraid of asking dumb questions. Remember that saying, he who does not ask a question remains a fool forever, meaning you might look stupid asking that question in class, but if you don't ask it, you'll never know the answer when instead you can just try to get over the fear of looking stupid in the moment. And honestly, the chances are, if you have that question, it's very likely that other people have that question too. Learn how to communicate your ideas clearly. So what I've learned over the years of working in the field is that the architects who become principals and partners, they have one thing in common. They are incredible communicators. But I feel like we're not really taught to do this enough. We're kind of thrown into the deep end, which is also why some presentations can go really badly, even if they have amazing projects. If you're interested, I actually have a few videos on presentation techniques. I'll leave it right here. As a general rule of thumb, try to spend some time before a deadline to think about how you are gonna present your ideas. And please don't just wing it. 
build systems around your workflow and stay organized. So this might sound a little boring, but this is one of those things that's going to save you so much time and energy down the road. And um, if you've been doing this regularly for a few years, it's going to it's going to provide you with a library of knowledge that you can access anytime. So there's certain processes that we do very regularly, like producing renderings or laser cutting or taking notes, where a lot of the steps in the process can be replicated. So for example, when I'm doing a rendering, I first try to identify which materials are worth rendering and which are better to do it in Photoshop. I have my camera settings preset for my exterior renders and I have a preset for all my interior renders so that I don't have to go in and like adjust the settings every single time. And in post-production, I have all my people and materials saved in a folder and all the people are divided into different folders based on what they're doing. I always try to save them in the same spot every single time. I think one of my biggest regrets in life is that I didn't start taking proper notes at an earlier age. I would write things down in my notebook and when I ran out of pages, I would just get a new notebook and eventually forget about the thing that I'd learned and written down. So now I track everything, all of the new information that I learned into Notion, into separate categories so that I can look it up later. Because if there's one thing that life has taught me, it is that you should never trust your brain to store information. Of course, there are certain things that cannot be turned into a system or are not worth turning into a system. But I think it's very important to kind of always have this mindset. Build good relationships. You can't get through architecture alone. That's a simple fact. Architecture is a social profession. You need to bounce ideas off each other. You need that person who's going to tell you that your idea is shit. <laughs> you need that person to go on late night snack runs with you. You need that person that you can complain to about your profs. If you're working in studio, you will naturally kind of develop these relationships because studio is kind of this like crazy magical environment that's very hard to replicate anywhere else. So that's a part of what you're paying for when you go to architecture school. There's all these people working on their own projects, like drawing, cutting, gluing, and putting things together and taking them apart. I can't even recount how many times I've had like breakthrough moments in the studio. Architecture is also a very small community compared to other fields that once you get into the workforce, a lot of people know each other um, or is once removed. Your friends in school are gonna be the people that you're gonna enter the workforce with you. So eventually um, they are gonna become your professional network. And you know, there's no better way to tell if um, somebody's gonna be a good coworker than like doing a project with them um, or working through those late nights in studio together. You'll you'll know exactly what that person looks like when they're sleeping yeah. yes. on their desk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll know what they smell like when they have really bad BO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you'll know all of their poor eating habits. Yes. And I still have friends from architecture school from like. 10 years ago that I would vouch for because I know their work ethic and I know that they're going to be a good fit at any firm. So although in this video I try to focus on maximizing the returns on your investment in time and energy, the most important thing you will actually get out of architecture school is not really something you can buy with any amount of money. Things like lifelong bonds and memories and like appreciation for beauty and like a life-changing experience that you won't be able to get anywhere else. It's not going to be easy or fast, but 
It's gonna teach you perseverance, amazing work ethic. It's gonna teach you to trust in your own abilities. You learn to work and like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, you learn how to work, work, work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. If you are just about to start architecture school, or maybe you're already a few years in, um, I'd love to hear which of these things resonate with you. And if you are an old fart like me and you've already graduated, are there things that you wish you'd thought about before you started architecture school uh, that you could share with the rest of us? Let me know down in the comments below. I'm really curious to hear what you think.